James chapter 3, verse 1. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which, though they be so great, and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a small member, and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beast, and of birds, and of serpents, and of things in the sea, is tamed, and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith we bless God, even the Father, and wherewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. That the fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter. Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either a vine, figs? So can no fountain yield both salt water and fresh. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness and wisdom. But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not, and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. We are studying the book of James and what it means to walk by faith, what it means to live the Christian life, what, it, what that looks like, what does the Christian life look like. What it means to let our faith shape our lives and how to tell if we're truly living by faith. And so far we've learned that we can measure our faith and how we respond to the Word of God, whether we actually put it in practice in our lives. We've also learned that we can measure our faith by how we treat others whether we give esteem to those that are like us and disesteem to those who are not like us or whether we are willing to help our brothers and our sisters in need. We have studied this out of the book of James in James 1 and 2. In James 3, we learn that our mouth will show us how far we've grown spiritually or how far we have not grown spiritually. We learn that our tongues will tell us a lot about ourselves. In James chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, the writer says, If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is in vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. The man described in James 1.26 is one that puts out the appearance of being religious, but he has a hard time controlling his tongue. He has a hard time controlling his mouth and what he says. He makes rash statements. He speaks in the, in the heat of anger. He, he criticizes others. He criticizes and runs down other people, and he has to lift himself up by tearing other people down. And that's a man who bridles not his tongue. And the Bible says he deceives his own heart and his religion is in vain. Pure religion before God in verse 27 is one that quietly gets it done. One who lives for God without having to put on the pop and circumstance to impress everyone. And in James chapter 3 we return to this topic and we learn that unbridled tongues reflect our true motives. Unbridled tongues can cause a lot of damage and our tongues should reflect the wisdom that is within us. Your tongue reflects your motive. Now, if we look in verse 1 of James chapter 3, the Bible says, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. Be not many masters. A master is a teacher. It is a teacher, one who is fit to teach, or at least one who thinks he's fit to teach. And he's a man that has influence. He draws a crowd. He has people that will listen to him. That's what a master is. And James says... To be not many masters. In other words, don't everyone in the church try to be the one who draws influence, who draws attention, who has people following him. Don't everyone try to be the leader. A church needs masters. It needs teachers. 
It's how we feed the flock of God among us. It's how we help each other in spiritual growth. Mature Christians are instructed by Scripture to step forward and disciple younger Christians. That is the order of things. Those who have been in the faith a long time, who have grown spiritually, should disciple those who are new believers and should help them along and help them learn and encourage them and lift them up when they fall. That's the natural, that's the way it should happen. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12 says. For when the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are, beso- and are become such as have need of milk, and not a strong meat. The more mature Christians were the ones that should have been teaching. However, in Hebrews chapter 5, they had become lax, and now need to be taught the basic fundamentals again. This verse, James 3.1, is not t- telling us that we shouldn't have Sunday school teachers. The church needs Sunday school teachers. It's not telling us that the senior members should not disciple the younger members. That's the way it is supposed to happen. What James chapter 1 is telling us is that we do not need to be a congregation of people who are trying to stand up within the congregation and be somebody. There are some people who want to be somebody. They want influence. They want notoriety. They want their name on everything. They want to make their mark. You have some people that just think that they're smarter. They think they have a better way and they're going to show everybody how it's done. In James's day, there were people who wanted to be the smartest person in the room, so they came up with all kinds of different doctrines and all kinds of different ideas and all kinds of different thoughts that they taught. And in order to get their point across, they would tear down other people in the process. This verse is a warning not to be that person. Be not many masters. And don't use your tongue as an avenue to discourage or to tear down others. Teachers and masters will receive the greater condemnation. Now that word condemnation means judgment. It's a judge's decision. It is a court ruling. We, the leaders and teachers of Grace Point Missionary Baptist Church, are held to a higher standard by God. It's not just a stricter standard that man puts on us. It's a stricter standard that God puts on us. We are judged not only by how we live but also what we teach and also what our motivation is in doing so. We are held to these high standards by the Lord. And we are held accountable if we lead anyone astray. That's the life of a preacher. That's the life of a pastor. That's the life of a Sunday school teacher. Is this a responsibility and a level of accountability you want to bring upon yourself? It's a responsibility that you should desire if the Lord calls you into it. 1 Timothy 3.1 says, If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth the good work. The desire to teach and lead is the desire for a great and beautiful work, but it's also a great responsibility. In doing so, you need to make sure your heart is right. Be not many masters. Be not many teachers. Be not many influencers. If God is calling you to step up and lead, step up and lead, but you better make sure your heart's right. There was some rabid speech in those early churches, and James points out that much of it revealed the self-serving and self-promoting motives of those who spoke. May we at Grace Point never be guilty of such things. May we never be guilty of having to lift ourselves up by tearing other people down. May we never be guilty of sitting here saying that, you know, we don't know about brother or sister so-and-so. They're just not as spiritually as mature as I am. May we never be guilty of having to tear other people within the congregation down in order to get our way or to get our point across. That is not of the Lord, and we will discuss that here in a few minutes. Unbridled tongues, not only do they reveal your true motivation, but they can cause devastation damage and unbridled tongues a man who cannot control his tongue is to be feared and if you cannot control your tongue your tongue is to be feared in James 3 verses 3 and 4 behold we put bits in horses mouths that they may obey us and we turn about their whole body behold also the ships which though they be so great are driven of fierce winds yet are they turned about with a very small helm whithersoever the governor listeth, or wheresoever the governor desires. Big things are driven by small parts. Those bits that you put in the horse's mouth, when you compare it to the size of the body of the horse, very small parts. 
those ships now in Paul's day their ships were driven by sail or they had they had these men that would row the ships but in our day we have these great huge aircraft carriers the length of three football fields those things are turned by a really small helm by a small rudder that's on the back of those things imagine the power it takes to turn an entire aircraft carrier it's just a rudder on the back of the ship and that's amazing. It takes a lot to turn that rudder, but that is still a small part that controls this massively huge vessel out on the ocean. Small things can control big things. You drove to, you drove to church this morning. Hopefully you have four tires on your vehicle. How much of your tire actually touches the road? About that much. About that much of your tire is actually in contact with the road. Doesn't seem like that much. But if you're driving 90 miles down the down the 90 miles per hour down the road and you whip the steering wheel to the right too sharply, you will roll your vehicle. That's how much that little piece of tire controls what your vehicle does. And if that little piece of tire loses contact with the roadway, you've got trouble. Big things are driven by small parts. In the same way, our tongue is just a small part of our body but it can alter the course of your entire life. Saying the right thing at the right time can get you a promotion at work. Knowing what to say when your wife is upset can make her more comfortable or can make her happy with you. Saying the wrong thing at the wrong time can get you fired. And saying the wrong thing to your wife at the wrong time can wreck your marriage. I have seen careers end because somebody said the wrong thing at the wrong time. Words can heal or they can wreck marriages. Words can heal or they can wreck friendships. Words can heal or they can wreck churches. And so James continues this thought in verses 5 and 6. Even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and is set on fire of hell. A tongue can set a small fire, much like a wildfire, can grow to a massive blaze that destroys everything. Forest fires start small. You have a campground, you've been burning a campfire, the thing is smoldering, it's going out, maybe you poured some water on it but you didn't make sure the whole thing was out, you leave it there, the wind blows, those little embers get over into the pine straw or whatever, get a fire going, next thing you know you have a massive forest fire. That's why we have Smokey the Bear. Smokey the Bear is telling us that only we can prevent forest fires. Literally, I think he's been sequestered out of a job through the federal government, but only we can prevent forest fires by making sure that all of our embers are out, that, uh, that we completely put out our little campfires. You know, you have a guy driving down the road and he's smoking a cigarette, throws a cigarette butt out the window, it catches the, fi it catches the grass on the side of the road on fire, sets the pasture on fire, next thing you know you have a hundred thousand acre blaze destroying Possum Kingdom Lake. These small little fire, little, little, little fire on the end of a cigarette, little deal can cause a wildfire big enough to destroy Possum Kingdom Lake or to, dis or to destroy the lost pines of Bastrop. It starts out small and the next thing you know you have a hundred thousand acre fire destroying homes, trees, national treasures and even towns. A word spoken in anger in, anger, in the heat of the moment can devastate a family, can devastate a friendship, can devastate a church, can devastate a marriage. So be aware because the tongue, even though it's a very small member, can cause a lot of damage. What you say can defile you. The word defile means to make dirty, to, to ruin the spotlessness of, to, to degrade. What you say can defile you. Verse 6 says the tongue is it, the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity, so is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body. What you say can defile your whole body. It can wreck your spiritual walk or reveal things that are in your spirit that you shouldn't have in your spirit. Jesus said in Matthew 15, 18 through 20, but those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart and they defile the man. 
For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashing hands defileth not a man. Now Jessica and I, when we sit down to have lunch, oftentimes we're delayed or distracted because she's got to go wash her hands and get the, uh, get the, set, the hand sanitizer out and get that going. Me, I'm already digging in. And so Jessica thinks, I'm going to get sick doing that. She says, you need to wash your hands. Here, here's some hand sanitizer. I don't like the hand sanitizer on my hands before I eat. It messes up the flavor of the food. <laughs> Throws that rubbing alcohol taste into the mix. And that's not good for fried chicken. Trust me on this. It's not the things that you eat, the things that go into the mouth, that defile the person. It's the things that come out. Because the things that come out of your mouth are the things that, are, that reveal what's in your heart. And if you have lying, hypocrisy, immorality, adulteries, thefts, false witness, blasphemies, if that's in your heart, that's going to be what comes out of your mouth. And your words defile you. The reason your words defile you is they show who you truly are in your heart. James 3, 9 and 10 say, Therewith we bless God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessings and cursings. My brethren, these things ought not to be. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessings and cursings. If any of y'all are on Facebook, you have a Facebook friend that they will that they will praise God with one status update and they'll cuss somebody out with the next status update. Okay, that's out of the same mouth proceedeth blessings and cursings. And what that shows you is that those cursings, that anger, that hatred, that bitterness is in your heart and it will destroy you. It will eat you alive. If that's coming out of your mouth, then you know that that's in your heart. And that needs to be dealt with. Because the fact that that's in your heart and coming out reveals that your heart is not pure no matter how many times you say, God bless you. If I say, God bless you, and then I'm cursing you the next moment, then I've got problems in my heart. My saying, God bless you, does not erase the fact that I cursed you earlier. I have a problem in my heart which needs to be dealt with. James 3, 11 through 12 says, Doth the fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either a vine, figs? So can no fountain yield, both yield salt water and fresh. The uh, fountain that you receive water from is either going to give you good water or it's going to give you bad water. It's not going to give you both at the same time. Brown County Water Improvement District spent a million dollars drilling a test well over on Corrigan Avenue, pulled out a bunch of salt water. The salt water they pulled out of that thing was 78,000 parts per million. That's how salty it was. Now, to give you an idea, seawater is 35,000. So it was twice as salty as seawater. Are we going to be able to drink water out of that fountain? We're not. Why? Because it's giving us bad water. That water has to be cleansed. And let me tell you, if you've got bad water coming out of your mouth, it's coming from a bad source. And there's a problem in your heart, and that needs to be dealt with. What comes out of your mouth shows what's in your heart. So an unbridled tongue should be feared for two reasons. One, it can cause devastating damage. And two, it shows that there are problems with your spirituality. There are problems with your spiritual walk. And so finally, we get to a point where we realize that our tongues should not be uttering cursings, should not be uttering criticism, should not be used in a destructive manner, should not be expressing sin and vice in our hearts. Our tongues should be reflective of our wisdom. Verse 13 says, Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. Our wisdom should be displayed in our good conversation. Now, on one level, that makes sense when you're talking about talking. Your wisdom should be displayed in that you speak well and that you talk well. But the word conversation in the King James Bible literally means a lifestyle. Your wisdom should be displayed by how you live. Your conversation is your lifestyle. So we should live out that faith that is within us. If you have the faith of the Lord in your heart, that should guide how you live. And if we notice that our speech or our behavior is getting out of line, we should repent. Verses 14 through 16 say, If you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not, and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. 
For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. If you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. If you have strife, if you have conflict, if you have anger or rage in your heart, don't celebrate that. Don't glory in that. Don't enjoy that. And don't lie to yourself and say that that's of God because the Bible clearly says that that is not of God. The next verse says, This wisdom descendeth not from above. This wisdom does not descend from the Lord. The wisdom that is angry, the wisdom that is tearing other people down, the wisdom that is stirring up conflict is not coming from God. God is not leading you to stir up strife and controversy. God is not leading you to start an argument. God is not leading you to split a church. God is not leading you to criticize your wife and call her names. God is not leading you to rebel against your husband. God is not leading you to disobey Obey your parents. God is not leading you in doing all that. Those are not things that come from God. Those are things that come from the world. It's earthly. It's sensual. It's devilish. For where envying and strife is, there's confusion in every evil work. So if we have these problems in our heart, we need to see them for what they are and repent from them. Because it's not from God. It's from Satan. It's evil and causes confusion and is behind every evil work. And then verses 17 and 18 say, But the wisdom that is from above, the wisdom that is from God, is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them, that make peace. The wisdom that is from above, the wisdom that is from God is pure. That word pure means free from carnality, free from the desires of the flesh, without hidden agendas. It is there is there is no hidden motive here, there's no hidden desire here, there's no hidden lust here. The wisdom that is from above is first pure. It is completely without anything of this earth. It is seeking God first and seeking only God. The wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable and gentle and easy to be entreated, easy to get along with, easy to reconcile with. Peaceable. It makes peace. It's full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. The wisdom from, that is from above doesn't tell you one thing, but it's got another agenda to it. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. God's wisdom is a pure and perfect wisdom and it's the wisdom our lives should reflect. You should be able to tell me something and I should be able to take you at your word. I should not have to figure out why you're really doing or why you're, what, what you're really up to. If you tell me something I ought to be able to take you at your word. And if I tell you something you ought to be willing to take me at my word. You ought not to be trying to figure out what's Leland really getting at here. We ought to be able to speak to each other and be able to take each other at our words. <coughs> Rash speech, harmful words, angry words, critical words, divisive words, words of conflict, they come out of selfishness and hidden agendas and hidden motives. Let's repent of that and serve the Lord in humility as we stand.